Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very pleased to be here. It's a great honor and a great pleasure. I would like to start by extending my deep gratitude for many of you who are sitting here, those who had invited me to Chicago many years ago and those who had invited me to Chicago right now, the Jewish Federation, the Divinity School, Professor Golb, my dear friend, Mrs. Leona Rosenberg, many people who have been very helpful and very, very friendly and very encouraging, Professor Rick Rosengarten, my friend, Professor Paul Mendes Floor, and many others who have been most helpful and most kind in facilitating this visiting scholarship and this public lecture. Thank you to all of you, and of course, to Dean Margaret Mitchell, who is chairing this program, and I had the joy of enjoying the fantastic reception of being a visiting scholar in the Divinity School of Chicago. Thank you very much. Now, hello. When, when Isaiah Berlin had been asked about half a century ago, what is the problem of the Jewish people? He answered, there is no problem really. They have only too little geography, far too little geography, and far too long history. Now, this is very true, because on the very little geography that the Jewish people always had, there were always disputes and quarrels. On the very long history that the Jewish people had, they always have been also quarrels and disagreements. I would like to note the fact that when President Obama had been visiting recently in Jerusalem, the first place that he was taken to visit was the Shrine of the Book. That's the place where some of the Dead Sea Scrolls are being presented to the public. Why did the government of Israel had chosen to take President Obama as the first place to the Shrine of the Book to see scrolls such as the scroll of Isaiah or the scroll of Sons of Light against Sons of Darkness and other beautiful scrolls there? Because, as a matter of fact, one can say, I quote, because the scrolls are testimony to the antiquity of Jewish roots in the land west of the Jordan. Now, there is no more antique evidence to the presence of the Jewish people in the land of Israel in the first millennium before the Common Era, a written evidence more ancient one than the Dead Sea Scrolls. Now, everybody heard about them. Very few people had read them. But the one interesting thing about them is the following. When they were found out between 1947 to 1956, in a very troublesome decade of the history of the Jewish people, right after the Holocaust, right after Independence War, before the Sinai War, when they were found out, they were designated by three geographical names. They were called the Dead Sea Scrolls. They were called Scrolls of the Judean Desert. They were called Qumran Scrolls. Those are all synonyms and correct synonyms. They were found, in fact, along in the Qumran caves along the west side of the Dead Sea. However, when one is using those geographical designations, one is free from answering the basic questions. Who wrote them? When had they been written? Why they were being written? Why they have been lost in oblivion for more than 2,000 years? How did it happen? Is it only accidental? Because as I said, when you use the geographical designation, you miss the issue. They certainly were found in a certain place, no doubt about that. But why they were found there? Who had written them? What had made such a huge library? There are between 900 to 1,000 fragments of parchment with one common denominator, which is usually not taken to sufficient attention. All 1,000 fragments, some of them are long, some of them are little shreds, all 1,000 fragments of parchment with no exception all of them are sacred writings. Among the thousand fragments that we had found, there is not a single private correspondence. There is no bill. There is no commercial, uh, commercial document. There is no ktuba. There is no any private document. All of them are sacred writings. Now, what do I mean by sacred writings? 
they are based on the biblical world. They take the freedom to expand the biblical world. However, the language is biblical Hebrew, basically, Aramaic, biblical Aramaic, little bit in Greek, but most of it, most of the scrolls are written in biblical Hebrew. Now, why so many scrolls written in biblical Hebrew and a few words which are not known to us, but basically anyone who reads biblical Hebrew can read the scrolls with not too great an effort. But why those scrolls were kept in oblivion? Why they were forgotten? Why they were found accidentally between 1947 to 1956? I was wondering about this question and I should start my talk by saying that I am deeply endowed and deeply grateful to the 120 scholars who had worked universally together in order to bring to print the thousand pieces of parchment. That was a very hard work, sorting it out, transcribing it, translating it, trying to understand what is that that we transcribe and translate and understand. Because when you are looking on a text that you know, it's not too much of a trouble. But when you look on text that you don't know, there is a trouble. How do you edit a text that you have never seen before? What would be the context? Now, the question that I was interested in was the following. There is a huge library. No writers are designated in the general scholarships other than in a general way it had been associated with the Essenes. I asked a librarian question. Let's say that those were books. And by now we have 40 volumes of the Oxford series of the, we call it DJD, Discoveries of the Judean Desert. Most of them have come, have come to print only in the 90s and in the first decade of this, the present century. When you have those numerous textual evidence in 40 volumes, they are accessible for everyone. Now everyone can read them. You don't need to be an Aramaic scholar or biblical scholar or ancient Hebrew scholar. Everyone can read the transcribed text. When we see the whole entire library, and this is an innovation only really of the last decade and a half, that the whole library is available for everyone who wish to read. I asked a question of a librarian. How would I divide it? What would be the general division, very general, not, you know, if you have thousand texts, you cannot divide it to thousand. You ask yourself, what are the common denominators of groups of text? How would I divide it in a very general way? I suggest to divide it according to the content of the scrolls, which makes sense, not according to presuppositions who had written them, but according to the simple librarian question, how would I identify them? How would I describe them? To which shelf should I put them? I suggest to divide them to five major shelves. Now, each one of those shelves could have under divisions, but in general, when we ask what do we have when we talk about those thousand pieces of parchment, some of them are in length of a Torah scroll, some of them are tiny, as are very tiny, less than one page, but we do have thousand different, about thousand different pieces of parchment. How should we group them? Now, I'll start from the obvious and known to the unknown. I would suggest to divide them to five groups. The first group is the biblical library. Now, we were fortunate enough to find testimonies in parchment, on parchment of the whole entire biblical library. Whenever I say Bible or biblical, I mean only the Old Testament. The 24 books in the Old Testament, we found 23 of them among the Dead Sea Scrolls. The book of Esther is not found, and probably for a good reason, and I'll discuss it later. However, all other 23rd book out of 24 books of the Bible are there. Not exactly always with the same tradition, with the same textual tradition that we are acquainted with. There are some slight differences. Some books are more variegated than the canonical biblical tradition. However, if we look on that in general, we can say that the people who put the, the scrolls in the caves 
had access to the whole entire biblical library. And remember, the Bible was written along a millennium before the Common Era, but had been canonized in a final version only after the destruction of the temple. The Bible was written on scrolls, not as one book, but on scroll. The scroll of Jeremiah, the scroll, is, the scroll of Isaiah, the scroll of Genesis. We found remnants of all the books of the Bible with the exception of the scroll of Esther. Why is that? The scroll of Esther does not have the name of God in it. That's a good idea. That's a good reason not to include it. Because all other biblical books have direct or indirect reference to the divine word or to the divine authority or to the divine revelation, the book of Esther does not. In a library that all, it, all what it has, all what it contains, could be defined as sacred writings, a book without a divine reference is not a sacred writing, thus would not be included. I would skip very closely on the biblical part, because you're familiar with the biblical part, I'll say that anyone who is doing any work on any single biblical book among the 24 books of the Old Testament would do very wisely to consult the Qumran edition of the Bible of the scrolls, because it has beautiful little and big differences, which shed fantastic light. More than that, after we say that about one-fifth of the collection is biblical books, which offer very interesting textual renditions, very interesting textual traditions, which were not known to us before the scrolls were found, like, for instance, we have the scroll of Isaiah, close enough to the biblical tradition. But we have another scroll of Isaiah, which have meaningful differences. Now, what is the meaning of those meaningful differences? It means that different communities had different recensions of the Bible. There was not only one canonical scroll of Isaiah, there were more than one recension. This is very interesting to us. We didn't know it. We know, of course, about the Septuaginta. We know about the Samaritan version. But we didn't know that there were other versions in Hebrew which are not exactly as the biblical tradition. Now, put the biblical part aside, because this is the known one, and that's the easiest one. I would like to go to a next group, which is partially known. It is called para-biblical writings. We knew about that in a vague way. We were familiar with collections known as pseudoepigrapha or apocrypha, in which books such as First Enoch or Jubilees or Testament of the Twelve Tribes were transmitted in various lingual traditions from antiquity to modernity. We didn't know their Hebrew origin. We never had access to the Hebrew origin of the Book of Jubilees, to the Aramaic origin of the Book of Enoch. We were fascinated to find the origins of the pseudo-epigraphic pseudo literature in Hebrew and Aramaic among the Dead Sea Scrolls. We didn't know about their existence. We suspected there once upon a, a time there was such a book, but we didn't have access to the origin. Now, that is easy to understand because the Book of Jubilees, the Book of Enoch, the Testaments of the Twelve Tribes were known to us before the Dead Sea Scrolls were found. However, here comes a whole other group of books which was utterly unknown to us. We call it, as I said, parabiblical, and it is based on the following principle. You may take any figure from the Pentateuch and tell about him an elaborated story. Let's say we're all familiar with Enoch from, or from Noah, or from Enoch, or from Levi, from the Pentateuch. The scrolls are telling us there is a book of Enoch, there is a book of Noah, there is a testament of Levi, there is a testament of his son Kehat, there is a testament of his grandson Amram. We didn't know about the existence of such literature until the scrolls were found. There, we had been granted with the unbelievable innovation that before the common era, and all the scrolls, or the absolute majority of the scrolls, have been written in the second century and the first century before the common era, 
very few on the first few decades of the first century of the common era, but the greatest number of scrolls have been written in the last two centuries before the common era. And as I said, copies of ancient books of the Bible have been, have been uh, re retrieved there as well. Now, about this second group that I was talking about, the parabiblical. We learned that there was a freedom of creativity, utterly unknown to us. Now, this is not a midrash. This is not an exegesis. This is not homily. This is not halacha. This is not anything of the kind that we had known before. This is something new. It is the freedom to retell the biblical history. We were not familiar with the existence of such freedom before the Bible, before the scrolls had been found. The third group, which is of great interest, the third group is called the mystical liturgical library. We didn't know about its existence. We didn't have a clue. Books such as Songs of the Sabbath Sacrifice, which are beautiful, beautiful angelic Hebrew. Please note the angels above us reading books. They are doing exactly what the angels are described in the Dead Sea Scrolls. They are always reading, teaching, chanting, officiating in a heavenly sanctuary. However, this part of the library, mystical liturgical work, with names like Hodayot, or thanksgiving, with names like blessings, with names like the uh, songs of the Sabbath sacrifice, were utterly unknown to us. And they were not found in one copy. They were found in many copies. There are like 13 copies of the songs of the Sabbath liturgy. There are quite a few copies of the thanksgiving scroll. There are numerous copies of the psalm scrolls, which include much more psalms than those which are known to us. The 150 scrolls, the, sorry, the 150 psalms that we know from the Bible are, of course, of great importance. But there are quite a few more which were not known to us in this beautiful liturgic shelf of the library. Now, I called it mystical liturgical. What does it mean, mystical? That's a library or that's a literature of crossing borders. Humans and angels are working together, are singing together, are officiating together. This is not something we had been informed about in the biblical library as came to us through tradition. Angels are vital in this library. Now they would say, they would say sentence such as, the holy angels are in their council, or the, old, the holy angels are in their midst. They were living, some of those who had written those traditions, with angels in their consciousness for very particular reason, but, which I would discuss a little later. However, when we describe the various shelves of the library, the first one is the biblical one, the second one is the parabiblical one, the third one is the mystical liturgical ones, which has angelic liturgy. The fourth one is polemical library that we didn't know anything about. We didn't know the Jews had written books such as the War of Sons of Light against the Sons of Darkness, that they had written books such as Pesharim, which means commentaries, where they are talking on people of evil against people of righteousness, where they are describing a, preach, a preacher who is a priest, a high priest preacher, who is called Moret Tzedek or Kohen Tzedek, teacher of righteousness and uh, priest of righteousness, who is working against preacher of evil and priest of evil. We didn't know any historical circumstances that justify such names. It was complete surprise. We didn't know that such a literature exists. And there is, as I said, the scroll of the war between Sons of Light and Sons of Darkness as, a, as an example of this polemical library, or the, or the scrolls which are known as Psharim commentaries, which are reinterpreting the prophetic visions for the future as are happening in the times of the people who are writing these scrolls. There are numerous other polemical 
uh, documents. However, the point is that it was utterly unknown to us. We didn't know that there is a huge literature of arguments. of war. The word polemic it comes from the Greek word polemos, which is war. This is a warlike literature, war aggressive literature, where one group is fighting vehemently against another group. We didn't have any historical knowledge on such a situation. We have a book called like uh, Apocryphon of Ezekiel. It is said there in Hebrew, Al ken it kara Israel ala Torah ve ala Brit. Thus the people of Israel have been torn, have been shred on the covenant and on the law. We didn't know about it. There is not a single historical clue telling us before the Dead Sea Scrolls were found that there was a horrible reef, that there was a rapture, that there was a war. We didn't know about it. So it just teaches us, it just, just sort of, uh, we can learn from that, that history is ocean of oblivion with islands of knowledge. We had found a new not only island, we had found a new continent which was utterly unknown to us. Before that, we had the book of Maccabees, not in the Hebrew canon, in Greek, in the Greek uh, canon. We had some sort of pseudo-epigraphical books in Greek, in Latin, in Gis. We had, very, we had the book of Ben Sira, a very interesting book in Hebrew and Greek. However, we didn't know anything of all what I've been talking about from a literature that had been written in the, in the two last centuries before the Common Era. Now the fifth part, which is of great interest, it is called, we can call it a sectarian literature, although I reserve uh, the use, I, I use this word with reservation, because when you say sectarian, you suggest that there is a center somewhere that one is dissecting from. However, when one is looking on 175 BCE, or on 110 BCE, or on 90 BCE, where is the center of the Jewish people exactly? Who is the formal leader of the Jewish people in the second century BCE? Is there a consensus of such historical leadership? No, there isn't. There has been no consensus on the leadership of the Jewish people in the second century BCE, in the first century BCE. It had been a time of turmoil. It had been a time of con considerable historical changes. I would say that in one, two sentences for the sake of brevity. In 175 before the Common Era, King Antiochus Epiphanes, the Seleucian king, had conquered the land of Israel and had imposed his idea of what was called bureaucratical order. He wanted to nominate his people in the temple because the temple was a place where sacrifices were offered for the sake of the king, not the Jewish king, for the sake of the ruler, according to the perception of Antiochus. He wanted to collect taxes in relation to ceremonial things in the temple. He wanted to organize the kingdom according to one calendar, a lunar calendar of the Greek empire. That was their calendar for years and years. When he approached the Jerusalem temple and he had ordered the officiating priest, Jason III, to officiate according to a new lunar calendar, the high priest had refused and he said, we will do everything you want, but we cannot officiate the temple according to a lunar calendar because we have a different system. The book of Daniel chapter seven is telling us in an illusory way, in an elusive way, the, the uh, revolution that had occurred in the days of a king that wanted to change laws and times, to change calendars and customs of days of gone by. However, to make a long story short, before King Antiochus Epiphanes, that's Antiochus IV, had conquered Jerusalem and had imposed a new lunar calendar, for a thousand years, nearly a thousand years, there had been another system, not a Seleucian system. It was the, it was the temple in Jerusalem. Now, we don't know much about it 
more than it's written in the biblical historiography. We know about the temple from the time of David. We know about the temple from the book of Kings, from the book of Chronicles. We have quite a lot of tradition about the temple, but we don't know quite a few details. The Dead Sea Scrolls telling us new things about the temple. They are telling us that the temple was arranged accord, the temple worship was arranged according to a solar calendar. I don't wish to pass a verdict whether this is a historical truism from the days of David or whether this is a projection from the time of the people who had written these scrolls. I don't know. I would just say that in the Dead Sea Scrolls, we have numerous documents who are talking about solar calendar of pre-calculated calendar emerging uh, commencing in the spring. While the Jewish calendar, known to all of you who are following the Jewish calendar, is starting in the autumn. The current Jewish calendar is starting in the autumn, in the month of Tishrei. While the biblical calendar states explicitly that the calendar starts in the spring, in the book of Exodus 12, we are told that the calendar is commencing in the month of the spring, the first month of the year, where the year is starting as a divine declaration of the beginning of freedom, of the epoch of freedom. It is given up in the time where the story of the departure from Egypt, the exodus from Egypt, to towards the way to become a free nation. Then there is a calendar introduced and it is said, this month, the month of the spring, is the head of the year or the first of the month, you would always start to count from the first month. Now, the Jews of today are counting according to a different calendar, starting in the month of the autumn, in the seventh month. We start the year by a holiday called Rosh Hashanah. There is no such holiday in the Bible. In the Bible, the holiday in the first of the seventh month is called the day of the memorial of the trumpets. Nothing to do with the head of the year. However, the point that I would like to make is the following. The people who had written the scrolls, and it was not one person and it was not one group. Those were many hands and those were many people and many books. However, when one is looking on the following question, after we know that there are five kinds of shelves, the biblical, the parabiblical, the mystical liturgical, the polemical, and the sectari sectarian one. The, sectar the sectarian one is those that define themselves as members of the covenant against others who are departing from the covenant. When we have those five shelves of different literature, we ask ourselves, is there any common denominator to all those various shelves? Is there one topic which is recurrent in the very different type of literatures which have been written by different hands and in different times? The answer is yes. There are a number of issues which are recurrent in different, in different literary genres by different authors, written in different periods. And the one which is most striking is the presence of a solar calendar, a calendar which the writers ascribe to a mythical ancient past. The people who had authored the book of first Enoch, it's called the Ethiopian Enoch because it was first known to us in the language of Giz, which is an Ethiopian uh, language, Semitic Ethiopian language, in the book of Enoch, chapter 72, 82, is telling us in great detail on the calendar of 364 days. In the book of Psalms that had been found in Qumran, entirely different genre, you know, Psalms. In the extra Psalms, those which are not known to us in the Bible, in the Psalm scrolls in the, which is presented in the shrine of the book, in column 27, we are told that David, king of Israel, the one who had been described as wise and as poetically gifted and as a prophet, according to this scroll, had authored 364 daily songs 
for each day of the year. He further had authored 52 sacred songs for every one of the Sabbaths of the years. He further authored 18 special songs for the holidays of the year. Now, in an entirely different kind of genre, let's say the Book of Jubilees, which is parabiblical because it is retelling the Book of Genesis. In the Book of Jubilees, we are told that Noah had stayed in the in the uh, ark, 364 days, which are divided equally to four seasons of 91 days, commencing in the spring. The same is true for the scroll of priestly watches, which is worked on a calendar of 364 days. The same is true to a letter called Miktzat Maaseh Torah, a few observations on the acts of the Torah, the scroll is commencing with a calendar telling us that the first week of the year starts in the spring and there are 52 weeks in every year and in each week a different priestly scroll is serving according to, uh, according to a calendar of 364 days. Now the centrality of the solar calendar could not be exaggerated in the library of Qumran. As I said, in various different genres, in various different literary modes, the centrality of the calendar is put forward. However, there are two questions. First of all, why did they choose 364 days calendar? While well, everybody else knows very well that the calendar has 365 days, it was a well-known fact in antiquity. Now, the answer to that is that it was a priestly calendar divided according to the priestly sevenfold divisions. Because if there was anything sacred to the priestly calendar, it was the following assertion. The covenant between God and his people is based on the following fact. Every seven day, one should not work on a Sabbath. Every seven holidays of the first seven months of the year, one must refrain from work according to the biblical law. The first seven holidays in the first seven months of the years are Pesach is the first one, Passover, the second one is the holiday, Chag HaMatzot, the holiday of the leavened bread. The third one is raising of the sheaf, HaOmer. The fourth one is the holiday of Shavuot, Pentecost or holiday of weeks. The fifth one is the holiday of the Trumpets Memorial, Rosh Hashanah, or the Yom Zikaron. The sixth one is the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippurim, And the seventh one is Sukkot, the Holiday of Tabernacles. All seven holidays have an exact date, an exact day, and all of them are in the first seven months of the year. What else is happening in those first seven months of the year? The seven species that the land of Israel is blessed with are all growing in the first seven months of the year. So the sevenfold numbering is of great importance, but it does not start and end with Sabbath and with seven appointed time of the Lord in the first seven uh, months of the year. It is proceeding with the seventh year, Shemitah or fallow year, where one is not allowed to work. And it proceeding with Jubilee year, every, after seven sevenths of years, in the 50th year, after 49 cycles of Shemitot, of fallow years, there is a great Jubilee. This is the foundation of the covenant for the people who had written the book of Jubilees or the scrolls of the priestly watches or the psalm scrolls from Qumran, because for them counting everlasting sevenfold divisions of time is most sacred obligation is the foundation of the covenant. Now that being the case, when they were when the high priest who had officiated in the temple was ordered to exchange the calendar, he had said, I cannot exchange the calendar. This is the covenant. This is the foundation of the Jewish people. This is what the covenant had been enacted. The king was not a friendly type, nor, was, nor he ever heard on democracy. He said, I'm the king, that's Antiochus, King Antiochus IV. He said, I'm the king, and I would 
impose my calendar for the sake of tax collection, nothing religious, for the sake of tax collection, for the sake of one administrative calendar for my whole empire, and the huge empire ahead. And there was one more thing. He wanted a birthday every month according to his own calendar. Ptolemy kings had this right. They could have a birthday every month, not like us who have it every year. Shearer had written about it many years ago when he wrote about the Seleucian kings. They had the privilege of having every month in the day that they were born a birthday which was an opportunity to do a celebration and opportunity to collect taxes around the ceremonial order. Now, none of that could have been done in the temple. He threw away the high priest from the house of Tzadok, who was officiating in the temple as the last high priest according to the biblical order. The biblical order is telling us that Aaron, son of Amram, son of Kehat, son of Levi, was the first high priest. His son, his son Pinchas was the second high priest. His, his son Elazar was the third high priest. His son Avishua, Buki, Uzi, Zrachia, Merayot, Achituv, those are the names of the high priest. They were officiating father, son, father, son, until the last high priest, Onias III, the son of Shimon, the son of Onias II, the son of another uh, Merayot and so on, the high priesthood, according to the biblical order, had been officiating in the temple for thousand years, from the time of Aaron, according, uh, according to biblical historiography, to the time of Onias III, who had been pushed away, who had been dethroned from the high priesthood, it's about thousand years. Now, not only he was pushed away, he was assassinated. His son, Onias IV, ran away to Egypt. That's where Onias Temple had been, uh, had been built and some of the ancient priestly lore had been kept. However, while the high priesthood of the biblical time had been dethroned, a new priesthood had been nominated. We call it the Hellenized priest. The period is called the Hellenized priesthood. It's a short period. It is from 175 BCE to 159 BCE. At that time, Jason, Menelaus, and Alchemos were Hellenized high priests. That means they had accepted, they didn't have much choice, they had accepted the Antiochus king calendar and the Hellenistic decree. A group known as Hashmonians had came forward and started a war about 167 before the Common Era. It lasted until 164. When the war was over, there were no more Hellenized priests, but there was, lo and behold, a whole new priestly dynasty. It is called Maccabean or Hashmonians, it's all the same. This is a group which have nothing to do with biblical priesthood. This is the bridge, this is the rift, this is the background where the Dead Sea Scrolls were written. Because what was biblical Israel until about 164 before the Common Era, that's when Dan the book of Daniel had been written, when it was biblical Israel until the high priesthood had been destroyed, and three, uh, three Hellenized priests were officiating. The first one was direct connection with the ancient high priesthood. The second one was not connected at all. The third one was not connected at all. However, as I said, the Hashmonians, who were from the priestly tribe, waged war. They had fought against the Hellenized priest. They fought against the king Antiochus and they managed to a certain degree to succeed. However, not all the way through. They were nominated afterwards by the heirs of Antiochus. Alexander Balas and Demetrius were the two heirs of Antiochus who were fighting. And the Hashmonians, who were warriors, offered help to the powers, to the military forces of one heir of Antiochus, Alexander Balas, and others offered some help to the other heir of Antiochus, 
Demetrius the first and or the second, they were fighting those two kings. Once Alexander Ballas had the upper hand, he had nominated Jonathan the Hashmonian to be a high priest. He was not from the high priesthood. He was not from the sons of Tzadok, the high priestly family, which was the only one that had officiated as high priest according to biblical Israel. Now, a new high priesthood had been nominated. They had officiated, apparently, according to the Greek calendar. The Greek calendar is a lunar calendar, while the priestly calendar was a solar calendar. The Greek calendar was, used, was based on human observation on the moon, changing calendar according to the day that the moon is rising. The solar calendar, the ancient solar calendar, according to the historiography of the scrolls, that had been composed by Enoch, son of Jared, in the seventh generation of humanity, who had been taught from the angels, who had been taught to read and write from the angels, who had been taught to calculate from the angels when he spent many years in heaven. On him, Enoch is the one on whom it is written in the book of Genesis, and Enoch walked with God, and then he was not, because God had taken him up. Now, this is a very strange sentence in the book of Genesis, chapter 5. It is extremely unusual in a line of people who are on each one of them, it is told, who had gave birth to them, to whom they had gave, had gave birth, how many years they had lived. On Enoch is the only one on whom it is said, Enoch had walked with God and then he was not because God had taken him. So Enoch didn't die. This Enoch, according to the book of Enoch, according to the first book of Enoch, the second book of Enoch, the third book of Enoch, and not all of them in Qumran, only the first one is in Qumran, and according to the book of Jubilee from Qumran, he is the one who had brought the 364 days calendar from heaven. This is the myth of the calendar claiming a very ancient origin to it. Enoch had stayed a year on earth after he had spent many, de many decades on heaven. He spent a year on earth to teach his son Methuselah, the calendar, who had taught it to his son, who had taught it to his son. This is the ancient calendar of the ancient priesthood, the pre-Diluvian priesthood. According to the Dead Sea Scrolls, there have been a high priesthood of the pre-Diluvian time. The last one is Malkitzedek. He was taken to heaven to keep the calendar there. According to them, Abraham had met Malkitzedek in the days of Abraham. He is known as Kohen Le'el Elyon, Malkitzedek, the high priest for a high god. And he was granted the knowledge of the ancient priestly writing. Now, it is a myth. It is beyond what the Bible is telling us. But for the people who had written the Dead Sea Scrolls, the myth of the calendar was of paramount importance. Nothing could be more important. So Enoch had brought it from heaven, as it is delineated in the book of Enoch. Enoch is, had learned it from the angels, as it had been written in the book of Jubilees. Enoch is considered to be a priest of righteousness, as it is written in some of the Dead Sea Scrolls and numerous other things about him. He was the first person who had learned to read, write, and calculate. He was the first person who offered incense. He's the one who inaugurated the temple worship in heaven. And there are numerous other stories to that effect, talking on the ancient origin of the calendar of 364 days of 52 weeks of pre-calculated precise order. Now, the people who had believed in this pre-calculated solar calendar had believed that this is one non-negotiable issue, absolutely non-negotiable. They left Jerusalem. They took with them, at a certain point, we don't know exactly when, they took with them scriptures from the temple library. It was theirs. They were officiating in the temple for years and years and years. They continued to write. They elaborated on the biblical tradition. They expanded on the biblical tradition. And when we ask ourselves, after we make like a very broad view on the thousand par pieces of parchments, which are constituting hundreds of books, what do they have that we don't? What is 
What is explicit to us, while one is reading the Dead Sea Scrolls, which is not known to us in other historical writings before or after the, uh, before or after the Common Era. Number one, number one generalization would be that most of these scrolls are engaged in holy time, in holy place, in holy memory, and in holy ritual. In one way or another, each one of these scrolls is engaged in holy time relating to the calendar, in holy ritual referring to the priests who are officiating according to the ancient sacred ritual of 52 Sabbaths and 364 days, as it is detailed in the scrolls of the priestly watches, as it is explained in the temple scroll. So if the first one is holy time, calendar, if the second one is holy ritual, priestly ritual in the temple, the third one is holy place. The holy place, according to the scrolls, is Jerusalem, Mount Zion. Let me draw your attention to the fact that Jerusalem is not mentioned in the Pentateuch directly even once. Jerusalem is first mentioned in the book of Joshua by the name of it. This is a fact that people usually don't pay attention to. In the Pentateuch, Jerusalem is not mentioned. In the Dead Sea Scrolls, recensions of the books which correspond to the Pentateuch, Jerusalem is in the forefront. In the Book of Jubilees, retelling Genesis, Jerusalem is mentioned three times in the first chapter of the Book of Jubilees, so nobody could skip it. Now, what is it about Jerusalem? God is saying, whether directly or through an angel, that he had chosen Mount Zion in Jerusalem to be the holy place where he would like to dwell. It is mentioned in numerous places. Jerusalem is celebrated in the scrolls which were not known to us. Jerusalem is celebrated in a scroll known as New Jerusalem. Jerusalem is celebrated in the Book of Jubilees and various other texts. The question is why Jerusalem is not in the canonical recension of the Bible. Now, holy place has two dimensions. One is the earthly one. Geographically, Jerusalem, Mount Zion. The other one is the heavenly one. Seven heavenly sanctuaries corresponding to Mount Zion and to the temple on it. On earth we have one temple with one divine chariot of the cherubim in it. In the scrolls, such as in the songs of the Sabbath liturgy, there are seven Firmaments. There are seven sanctuaries, there are seven temples, and seven chariots of the cherubim. Now, in the mystical writings, you multiply by seven what had been lost on earth. There was no temple in Jerusalem for, for the priest from the house of Tzadok from the year 175 before the Common Era. After the last high priest, Onias III, had served there and have been dethroned in 175 BCE, their only temple was in paradise, in heavenly sanctuaries, when they correspondingly with the angels were officiating. A huge amount of literature among the Dead Sea Scrolls is engaged with the angels. Why? The angels are called in a very interesting name, very suggestive name. For Hebrew speakers, they are called Kohanei Korev, the angels, which means priests of sacrifices. The angels are designated as priests of sacrifices. Now, they don't sacrifice animals as they did in the temple. They sacrifice incense and liturgy. The order of the sacrificial liturgy corresponds to the order of the sacrifice in the temple. And a song like songs of the Sabbath liturgy is corresponding to the Sabbath offering in the temple as were designated according to the biblical order of the sacrifices. So whatever the priests were doing on earth and were not allowed to do anymore, those who were associated with the house of Tzadok, is being done in heaven by the angels. So for them, the priestly worship, which is eternal, the eternal cycles of Sabbath, Jubilees, appointed time of the Lord, fallow years, is carried on in heaven by the angels who are working according to the cycles of the calendar. So what was lost on earth is 
perpetuated in heaven. What was lost on tangible things on earth is perpetuated in mystical music and song in the seven heavenly sanctuaries. Now those are different kind of literature. The 52 songs of the Sabbath are described in the scroll of Psalms. The songs themselves that we had found and Carol Newsom had put together in a beautiful edition, Songs of the Sabbath Sacrifice, we have the descriptions of the angels working together with the priests. The priests are calling the angels to engage in the sacrificial work of the Sabbath in the heavenly sanctuary. We have the scrolls of the priestly watch telling us on which date and which day the sacrifices should be offered. We have the temple scroll to tell us what exactly is going on in the temple in relation to the sacrificial work. What is the order, how is it done, on what date, and so on. Those are different texts. All of them are corresponding to temple worship, to sacrifice, to priestly watches, to sacred calendar, all of them, with no exception. Now, if I said there are about four or five distinctive things which are common denominator to most of the scrolls. One of them is solar calendar, sacred calendar of 364 days. One is holy place, Jerusalem, Mount Zion. One of them is angelic presence corresponding to priestly temple worship. And one of them is, one of them is sacred memory, which relates to the beginning of the priesthood. In Qumran, you begin the priesthood with Levi, and not with Aaron, his grandson. You start the ancient pre-Diluvian priesthood with Enoch. You end the pre-Diluvian priesthood with Malkitzedek. We found the Malkitzedek scroll in Qumran. He's an angel priest. There are numerous angels. Now, the interesting thing is as follows. In the rabbinical literature that had been written and edited and composed in the first few centuries of the common era, it was put into writing later, but it had been discussed and oralized and edited in the first few centuries of the Common Era. There are no angels. I'm talking on the Mishnah and the Tosefta. There are no angels. There is no paradise. There is no Enoch. There is no calendar. All what was so important for the priests is utterly unknown in the early stratas of rabbinic Judaism. Now to step one, step backwards. I said that angels are present in each one of this, each section of this literature. In the war of scrolls of time of, of uh, in the war, sorry, in the scroll of war of sons of light against sons of darkness, the angels are conducting the war. The priests are fighting with horns. They don't have any kind of, uh, they're not really fighting as soldiers. They are fighting with horns, with trumpets, with musics, with angelic names. It is a mystical war. It's not an earthly war. Why do they call themselves sons of light? Because they believe in the solar calendar. Why do they call their opponents sons of darkness? Because they believe in the lunar calendar. So it was a calendar war more than anything. But the calendar was the basis of the covenant for people who believed in the biblical era in the biblical order, in the sanctity of the biblical priesthood, in the sanctity of the temple worship, all what constituted ideal biblical Israel. I don't say that that was the real order, I say that was the ideal order. Now at 175 BCE, when the priest of the house of Tzadok had been deposed and disrobed. They left Jerusalem at a certain point and took with them their library. That was the only thing they were allowed to take because you were not allowed to take anything of the temple materials or anything of the temple objects. They were sacred and they were not to be touched or living outside of the temple in any manner. The one thing which was not restricted according to any biblical law was the books in the temple library. We know from the father of Antiochus, Antiochus the Great, that he gave exemption for the authors of the, exemption for the scribes of the temple from a particular taxation. We know that there was a temple library and there was a temple, uh, there were temple scribes. 
Apparently, they took the temple library. There was no greater public library in Jerusalem. And what we had found in Qumran is first and foremost a huge library, which is composed of various things. But let's assume that the biblical scrolls, the huge amount number of like 270 biblical scrolls of the, 24, the 23 books of the Bible were found in Qumran, not the things that they had written there, basically things which had been in the temple library and were taken out. They continued to write all the various things that I talked about. And when I say that they were interested in holy time, in holy place, in holy ritual, in angel priestly common worship, in holy sacred memory, I would like to ask, what is the word that I had used most frequently, priestly. It is priestly awareness. It is priestly memory. It is priestly interest. However, most of the scholars who have been working on Qumran suggested from the very beginning of the scholarship in the early 50s to associate it with the Essenes. The Essenes are not known in the Hebrew language. The Essenes are first introduced to us in the writings of Philo from Alexandria. He's talking on wonderful people, four thousands of them who are living all around the land of Israel, when the measure of goodness and or virtue had been spread all around. Well, I wish to know where exactly Philo was traveling, where he saw all these good virtues, because of what we know in the first century, of the land of Israel around the time of Jesus, around the time of the rabbis, around the time of the Pharisees. It was definitely not exactly virtuous, to say the least. But Philo said that 4,000 of them are living all around the land of Israel. Philo had written in the first half of the first century of the Common Era. The second testimony about the Essenes is Pliny. Pliny was a great historiographer, a great army military, a great writer. In his book, Natural History, he's telling us that he know or he had heard or he had witnessed a group of very strange people, the strangest of all that he knows, who are living along the western coast of the seashore, and their name is Essenes. As I said, the word Essenes in any way is not known in the Hebrew language or in the Aramaic language, but Philo is telling us that they are living for thousands of generations, surprisingly, celibate life with no women and with no children. Philo says the same, they are monks, they are celibates. Now, the third witness, and I'm doing it very quickly because I know I have to conclude, but Philo is the first witness, Joseph, uh, Plinius is the second witness, and Josephus is the third witness. Josephus is telling us in a more elaborate way that among the Jews in the land of Israel, there, were, there was a group known as Essenes, which is extremely virtuous, which is illustrious in its manners, in its ideals, in its ideal life. They love the elderly, they care for the sick and for the poor. They don't allow children among their midst. Most of them don't have, very few of them may have wives, but most of them don't. They don't believe in women. Basically, they're celibates and monks. However, the one strange thing is that those extraordinary people, Philo claims that they are known from the days of Moses in his book Hypothetica, those extraordinary thousands of individuals who had lived for thousands of years according to Pliny and who are all around according to Josephus are not mentioned in the New Testament written in the very same time that Pliny and, Phi and uh, Josephus are writing. They are not mentioned in the Mishnah. They are not mentioned in the Tosefta. They are not mentioned in the Dead Sea Scrolls. They are mentioned only in Greek and Latin in Philo, Josephus, and Plinius. Now, it is, it is easy to do the conjecture. Here we have description of people with no books, and here we have books with no authors, okay? So people did like that. Now, we heard about the Essenes from three important sources. However, there was not a single book, shred of a page, one sentence, which was ascribed to them or had been quoted 
by anyone from them, not to say any book or piece of paper that they themselves had written. However, we know that there was such a group, as I said, by three important witnesses. But no scriptures were available. On the other hand, between 1947 and 1956, thousand scriptures of unknown kind had been found out in Qumran, along the Dead Sea. No immediate authorship had been labeled to them, although all what one had to do is to open and read. However, it was very hard to open and read because while they were they were found between 47 to 56, 1956, they became available to the scholarly community at large only in the 90s, only in the 90s, and only in the, in the course of the 2000s. I won't go into all the disputes about it. I would just say they were unavailable. Only few could have read. Those who have read them said, but it is written, the priest of the house of Tzadok and their allies in endless places. It is about temple, it's about the Zadokite priests, it's about biblical Israel, it's about sacrifices, it's about priests and angels, it's about the 12 children of Jacob, it's about the covenant of the Bible. Why should we append it to the Essenes who are not associated in any way to a solar calendar, to temple, to priest, or to any belligerent nature? The scrolls include polemical writings, very, very belligerent, hateful, spiteful against people who live according to a different calendar, about people who are traitors of the covenant. None of that is even hinted in relation to the Essenes. However, history of scholarship was that at the first two decades of the scroll scholarship, Jewish scholars were not allowed, according to the Jordanian uh, government that had the scrolls in Jerusalem from 1948, when East Jerusalem had become Jordanian territory, until 1967, when Jerusalem had been reunited or conquered or freed or liberated, depends on the way that you see it. However, Jerusalem, East and West are combined. And then, Jewish scholars and Israeli scholars were allowed to read the scrolls for the first time, all those who were not available before 1967. However, in the many years that had passed from early 50s, where first scholarship was uh, available until the end of the until the end of the 80s, which really scholarship went back into fruition, it was common that the authors were monks who were called Essenes, who were living celibate lives in a celibate place in the desert. Now, we don't know where the authors of the scrolls lived. We have no idea. This is a conjecture and assumption. We know where the scrolls were found, in, in caves. There is no way to live in those caves. Very few people could live in the air conditions, without air condition, of the desert next to the Dead Sea. Very few and very young and very strong can survive there. However, there was no real huge community of thousands of people there. However, because of the fact that only Catholic monks and Protestant priests were taking care on these scrolls, from, 19, from 1948 to 19, to, as I said, to 1967, and then there was quite a long time before they had become available, it had been stabilized and asserted that the Essenes are part of the scrolls, and the scrolls are part of the Essenes. While this is not really true, because the scrolls don't have the name Essenes in any way, while it has numerous times the priests of the house of Tzadok, the children of Aaron, the associates of Moses. They have biblical Hebrew, they have biblical concept, but they were associated with the Essenes because the monks who were doing wonderful work assembling the pieces of the scrolls in the Rockefeller Museum envisioned the writers of the scrolls as ancient monks who were living celibate life. Now, we don't know anything like that. We are not told that the writers of the scrolls are celibates. They are talking on women, they are talking on children, they are talking on family life. There is no reason to assume that all the writers of the scrolls were monks. However, history of scholarship has its 
fashions and its beliefs and its cornerstones. And ever since, it had been, uh, it had been defined that these scrolls are that the scrolls are primarily an Essene library. And the scrolls are reflections of monks and celibates' life, their biblical context, their priestly context, Jewish priestly context, their very ancient, uh, their very ancient uh, nature as primary documents from the ancient Judea, that had been pushed aside, and only their connections with the Essene of the first century, 250 years er later than the time that the scrolls and its disputes were happening. The scrolls were started to be written, those which are not biblical, after 175 BCE. To the days of Josephus, it's 250 years later. Why should we take Josephus' testimony on the Essenes to be appended immediately to the scrolls. The scrolls tell us very well what they are. They introduce themselves as the temple scroll, as the scroll of priestly watches, as sacrifices, as priestly, as priestly liturgy, as angelic liturgy. They have nothing to do with their sins. They have everything to do with the history of the tribe of Levi, with the testament of Levi, the testament of his son Amram, the, the testament of his son Kehat, the testament of his grandson, and so on. It is saturated with priestly issues, priestly concerns, priestly language. But ever since it had been appended as a sins, that was the corner that it had to be left. And anyone who dares to say, let us look again and see whether the overwhelming priestly concerns of holy time, holy place, holy ritual, and holy memory should be taken into consideration before the Essen theory should be taken as the only foremost consideration, that is usually accepted with great resentment. Thank you very much for your attention, and I would be happy to receive some questions. Archaeology. I don't decipher archaeology. I don't have any expertise in archaeology. I'll just say one thing. The community that had been burying its dead in Qumran has a big cemetery. Tiny bit of this cemetery had been dug. I don't think we're allowed to make presumptions on account of huge cemetery, which only very little of it had been. And as I said, I don't do archaeology. I'm looking on text, not on, not on remains, not on stones. That's a whole science of its own. I leave it to people who are experts in archaeology. <laughs> okay. Yes, please. Do you think that the, uh, the archaeological findings Well, I would never say that I think that they have nothing to do. What I say is the scrolls represent various communities, and they have been written in various periods. As I said time and again, different genres, different hands, different periods. I think it won't be wise to assume that all what is presented in the scroll, which is so rich, had to be eliminated to the findings of the archaeological site, which might be a Hashmonian fortress, which might be a place of making paper. You know, anyone who reads an archaeology of Qumran, there are 12, 13 different uh, theories to explain the one archaeological site. As I said, I don't do archaeology. I don't feel that I have the expertise for that. But I would suggest that if we have 500 hands who had written these scrolls, we should not assume that they all had 
they'd live there. I would say this is a place like a library or like a place that you keep very dear treasures to you. But I won't say that we should overlap the archaeological site with the content of the scrolls. I would not separate it totally, but I would not think that we should overlap it for 100 percent. Yes, please. Uh, could you kindly raise your voice? <laughs> no, I said there are no mention of paradise, which is very important, of Enoch, of angels, of solar calendar, and Jerusalem and Jerusalem Mount Zion as the holy place. Well, thank you for asking so that would allow me to say the one thing that time did not permit before. Uh, after the destruction of the second temple, there had been a profound change of the guard. Whoever was officiating in the temple, whether it was before the Hashmonite priests for 120 years, later on Herodian priests, later on, uh, you know, the different chapters in the history of Judea in the first century of the Common Era, after that, after the destruction of the temple, everything had changed. There is no more temple and there is no more priestly service. A new group is emerging. Of course, it had all the roots, but a new group is emerging to the forefront. They are called Pharisees, which is derived from the word lahem al piadonai, which means to interpret according, that's a biblical site. It is derived from the root lifrosh, which means to interpret. Okay, that they were new interpreters of the canonized law. The Bible was not canonized before the second century of the Common Era, as 24 books. It had been canonized in the age of Rabbi Akiva and Rabbi Yoshua after Rabbi Yohanan ben Zakkai. Those are the Pharisees, which later on had been called rabbis or Tanaim. They have various names, but the common denominator to all of that is one. They do not allow to write. They insist on oral teaching. They don't allow to create new books. They insist on new innovative interpretations of the highest profound kind. But we should say that in order to allow free interpretation, they had to canonize the Bible. So they would say, out of the various scriptures which might have been available, we chose the 24 books, 24 and no more. We know from the Talmud that there have been arguments if the book of Ezekiel should be in, if the book of Song of Songs should be in, if Estelle should be in. The final 24 books of the canon were the closure of creative sacred writings or creative holy scriptures according to the rabbis. They did not allow any continuity of writing. Now, there were many books which were not chosen to be within the biblical canon, such as the book of Enoch, the book of Jubilees, the book of the 12 tribes, the songs of the Sabbath sacrifice, the temple scroll, all of them are sacred writings, with no exception. All of them are talking about heavenly issues, angelic issues, divine commandment, halachic things. However, they were excluded. Why would they exclude, be excluded? Because the rabbis, so to say, had decided that any book which is focusing on priests and angels, and as any allusion to this 364 days calendar, would be deemed as Sfarim Chitzonim, which means the books which are left outside, the external books. We call them in English pseudoepigrapha or apocrypha, but in Hebrew it's more precise. It's the books which were left outside. They were left outside by Rabbi Akiva, who is telling us in the Sanhedrin, anyone who will read in the external books, those which were left outside, has no share in the world to come. That's a very strong act of censorship. However, those books which were left outside are the books that we had found in the Qumran library. Now, we know this dispute as the dispute between Pharisees and Sadducees. In Hebrew, Prushim Vetzdokim. Sadducees are the priests from the house of Tzadok. That's all what it means, Sadducees. Later on, they had bad reputation because of their role in the New Testament, because of their fighting with the rabbis. But the priests from the house of Tzadok, who had written 
and who had officiated in the temple for a thousand years before the common era, had their own memory, had their own visual perception, had their own conceptual world, and they fought for it. The rabbi said, any book with 364 days calendar, any book with priest angels, any book about Levi, about the sons of Levi, about the work of Levi, and so on, would be, of course, outside. There is no need for that for other generations. We chose those books that we believe that would be meaningful for later generations. We won't choose the temple scroll because it is not relevant, there is no more temple. We won't choose the priestly watches, scroll, the scroll of priestly watches, because there are no more priestly watches, because there is no more temple. So we can explain why they left them outside, but it hasn't been noted enough that all what's important to the priest is utterly put aside in the rabbinical new literature. I'll give one example to make it uh, understandable. The word covenant, brit, is one of the most frequent words in the scrolls of the in the scrolls of the Dead Sea. The covenant between God and His people, God and the priests, uh, people of Israel, and God. The word covenant is a major word. The word covenant, in that meaning, is completely erased from the Mishnah. There is no such word anymore. So, as I said, what is central in the priestly literature is un seen or unwitnessed in the new rabbinical emerging literature. They had a new agenda. The priests were overlooked. When they describe the chain of transmission of the Torah, they don't mention this. They don't mention the priest at all. They deleted them. In the Bible it is said that the Torah has to be taught and transmitted by the priest. Very, very clearly it is said so. Moses says so to, to his tribal brothers, the Levites, that they should teach the statutes of ja to the people of Jacob, to the people of Israel, the law to the people of Jacob, and so on. It is obvious that the priests in the Bible are entrusted with the biblical transmission of the law. According to the rabbis in the chapter of the fathers, they were never priests at all in the biblical transmission. So what they care, what one group care a great deal, the other group erased altogether. Yes, please. Thank you very much for this talk. Um, I, I find your, your distinction between the scrolls and the... Between the what? I find your differentiation between the scrolls and the EC yeah. um, convincing. But what I don't understand, are you, are you suggesting then that, this, that the house of Sado or did you just... Well, what I suggest is only what is written in the scrolls. The scrolls mention time and again, time and again, the priests from the house of Tzadok and their allies. Thousand times. I mean, it is mentioned time and again, time and again. The priests of the house of Tzadok and their allies. Now, I don't say, not at all, that only the Zadokite priest had written it. Of course not. Prophets were writing, poets were writing, people of different talents and inspiration and prophetic knowledge were certainly among the authors, as we know from the biblical library. However, what I say is that wherever there is any uh, direct description of the people that should be addressed. The people who are, de who are defined as the priests of the house of Tzadok and their allies is always in the forefront. So when, the, when you look on the scroll of blessings, who should be blessed? First of all, the high priest from the house of Tzadok. Second, who should be blessed? The priest from the house of Tzadok and their allies. The third one is the uh, pr president of Israel or something like that. So they are always in the forefront. They are the leadership. They signify biblical Israel ideal priestly leadership. As I said, I don't know if it ever has been such the case, but we do know from the Bible that the only high priest, the only high priests that were serving were from the high priest of the house of Tzadok. That is a well-known stuff. When Ezekiel is talking in the last chapters of his book, 4048, on the 
future temple. He's talking on the high priest from the house of Tzadok, those which are close to God and chosen by him. No other group is described in these words. So the people who had written the scrolls were very much interested in the priestly lore, in the priestly legends, in the priestly myths, in the temple worship. That was their backbone. That was their focal, that was their focus. That was their most intrinsic interest. And we should respect it. We shouldn't say the priestly nature of the scrolls doesn't matter. It matters because it is everywhere there. We shouldn't say that this is secondary. It's not secondary, it's primary. We can find evidence on holy time via calendar, on holy time and ritual via priestly watches, on holy ritual via temple sacrifices and stuff in every page that you would open. So it is, for them, the only common denominator that you can say about the scrolls that have been found along the shores of the Dead Sea is that they were kept and authored and reserved and transmitted by people who believed in the ideal biblical Israel and in the complete responsibility of people who associate themselves with this conservative past, with the priestly house of Tzadok, to continue to believe and to work on those ideas which have been completely pushed away to oblivion. In the day that the United Nations had declared on the state of Israel in 1947, these scrolls were found in the very same day. As like a long Shalom, a long uh, greetings from ancient past. In the very same day where the United Nations had declared about the acknowledgement of a new state of, as the state of Israel, these scrolls were first introduced. So they were in oblivion for 2,000 years and more. They were unknown. They were certainly not the central part of Jewish memory. But I would like to respect the other memories, the alternative memory, the shreds of memory that were entered to oblivion. And yet they have, we have recovered them by a miracle, you know, by a chance. It's wonderful that they have been recovered. We should pay attention to the other memories, to the other mythologies, to the other point of interest and focus of devotion which had informed the Jewish people of the two centuries before the Common Era and of the few decades of the, first, uh, of the First Era. I believe that we should take a lesson from there. There was never one authoritative Jewish community. There was always splinters. There was always disputes. There was always disagreement. However, if you would ask, what is the one single thing that the Jews shared always? It was their capacity to read and write. They may use it for belligerent writing. They may use it for all kinds of fights. But they would always say, we have sacred writings. We have holy scriptures. We can read and we can recreate and we can command and we can do exegesis and we can do law, but we can also do myths and mysticism. We are free people to write, although we were told by Rabbi Akiva that we should not read the external books. We had read them some way or another during the centuries. Many of them we were not familiar with. Now we are lucky to live in a century that they are easily available to anyone who is interested in ancient history and in the way that one, sir, one can cross the waves, of, waves and turmoils of historical destiny. We'll conclude here. Thank you very much.